Hi, my name is Cade Levinson. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I'm giving a presentation today on whether the decline of my city is due to historical overproduction or failed reconstruction. Uh, we're going to start here with just a short clip from a recent CNN video uh, on a munitions factory in Scranton, Pennsylvania today. In the steel furnaces of Scranton, Pennsylvania, the weapons of war are in high demand. One ton metal rods, heated and forged into about 11,000 high explosive artillery shells a month. CNN got a rare look inside the Scranton Army ammunition plant. One of only a few in the country that make this crucial round. Here, specially made steel is heated to 2,000 degrees, and slowly shaped step by scorching step into its final product. Nestled within a mineral-rich valley between the megalopolis hubs of Philadelphia and New York City, one can derive the totality of the characteristic of the Great American Experiment, its existing historical promise, and its current wanton impoverishment in the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Scranton epitomizes the tragic cascading arc of today's post-industrial cities. Its central role in literally tying the nation together with its production of T-Rail during the American Industrial Revolution, and as the steel and energy powerhouse crucial to Union efforts during the American Civil War, were followed by increasingly precipitous decline, leading to its current state of industry described here in Chris Hedge's 2018 book, America, the Farewell Tour. We are government, education, and medicine, former Scranton Mayor Christopher Doherty said of the city's principal institutions. There is really no manufacturing anywhere. Hedges continues, this is not quite true. Scranton makes munitions. Weapons are one of the last products still produced in America. The Scranton Army Ammunition Plant, SCAP, makes a series of projectiles including 105mm and 155mm shells. SCAP is part of a permanent war economy costing over $1 trillion a year. From another recent article on the Scranton Armaments Plant, it's not really possible to ramp up production of the 155mm shell and then shut it down again if the war in Ukraine were to end in the next few months. It's also not economically feasible to keep paying for ammunition that no one is using just to keep factories open. Armaments production is a rare industry that, for national security reasons, has to remain at least to a certain extent in the United States. But the overall decline in the American industrial base still has an impact. There are fewer workers with the necessary manufacturing skills than there were when the Scranton plant began operating. Finding enough qualified workers hasn't been an issue in Scranton, where the armaments factory is a long-time presence and many families have worked at the plant for generations. The United States Army plans on increasing the production of the type of munition produced at SCAP by 500%. Given these facts and Scranton's unique role of having both the fixed and variable capital, the plant, and the people required for such an increase in production, would not Scranton be best served economically by the indefinite continuation of the war in Ukraine? Regularly on the verge of municipal bankruptcy, what more could the city hope for than a permanent increase in demand for its last vestigial industry? Since 2012, Scranton has sold to private companies its sewer authority and parking authority in order to keep solvent. At least SCAP keeps the city afloat by putting its workforce into action instead of its essential holdings into fiscal prostitution. We can better understand Scranton's greatest benefit by understanding what led to its current depressed state. Let's look at the history. What was the height of commerce in Scranton? A triangulation of energy production, materials manufacturing, and transportation made Scranton arguably the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Its unparalleled reserves of anthracite coal fueled its iron furnaces, which in turn produced rail lines sent across the country. From Eileen Freeman's Anthracite Trust, the new economics of wealth and power, the Industrial Revolution, as viewed on the horizon of world economy, could only succeed with the help of the coal fields of northeastern Pennsylvania. Scranton produced the United States' first large-scale order of rail, which previously had to be imported from England. What was then called the Scranton Iron and Coal Company would eventually be producing 150,000 tons of iron and half a million tons of steel rail a year, accounting for one-sixth of the total national rail output. The city's growth rate for a good while was larger than that of New York City. The Civil War is often considered the apex of this period of production. To quote a local historian, the Civil War spurred rapid economic growth in Scranton. 
Economically, the Civil War was excellent for business in Scranton. The war effort increased the need for the anthracite, iron, and machinery which the city specialized in producing, and both the coal mining of the valley and the work of the machine shops were doubled in a very short time. Local myth then indicts this as a fatal Icarus-like period of overproduction, and that the subsequent crash in demand sent the city on its prolonged plummet to its current deindustrialized state. As one founder of a borough of the city put in his memoir, A Half Century of Scranton, both labor and capital began to develop the arrogance that insensibly grows from unbroken and unprecedented success. Perhaps Scranton would have most benefited then by never starting its industries to begin with, or allowing Generals Jackson and Orlee to make their way up through Gettysburg and take hold of the anthracite fields, as they wished to do. Folded into the Confederacy victory, Scranton could have become a sleepy, pastoral, purely agrarian economy, or just sold its coal on the global market and let the manufacturing and iron puddling to its betters. Or perhaps, if economic crash were inevitable post-war, Scranton should have fought for there to be a permanent war economy, economy way back then, for the indefinite prolongation of the Civil War, and today it could be sending munitions to both Ukraine and Virginia. The faulty myth of overproduction produces both of the extreme ends of this hypothetical hyperbola. The truth of the matter is that Scranton was at no point overproducing, but was from even before the Civil War, and especially subsequent to it, victim of the economic warfare of underdevelopment. As the leading economist of the American system, Henry Carey, put it, The industrial history of the world may be searched in vain for any so wanton waste of wealth, happiness, and national power as has, by aid of the combined efforts of British and Eastern free trade believers in cheap raw materials, and in the advantage of, of cheap labor, been perpetrated in the coal region of Pennsylvania. This is in large part due to the role water plays in mining. Most of the coal in the coal region of Pennsylvania is under the water line. If you take the Lackawanna coal mine tour, you can hear the water around you as soon as you get below that water line. For a mine to be viable, it needs to, be, it needs to continually pump out this water, or the mine will flood and force to be abandoned. Carey continues, Mines must be kept free from water whether coal is shipped or not, and pumping is an expensive process. The difference to the operator from maintaining a mine in idleness on one hand or full work at the other is so small as scarcely to be imagined by those not familiar with mining operations. Stoppage to him, therefore, is almost utter ruin. When do stoppages occur? When demand is absent. A contraction in the currency makes money hard to get, lowering domestic commerce generally, and the demand for coal subsequently, or protections are lifted from the domestic coal industry and cheap imported coal floods the market. When these stoppages occur, Carey also puts out, the mine and the furnace, bases of the industrial pyramid, are always the first that are, by reason of absence of demand for their products, compelled to stop. They are, too, always and necessarily last to resume operations. Carey estimated that previous to the Civil War, due to stoppages like these, the PA mining region made, not, made back not even two-thirds of the value that had been put in for the development of the region. Immediately following the Civil War, a gang of New England Tory manufacturers and the senators that represented them ensured both the contraction of the currency and the flood of cheap coal would occur. This, and not overproduction, primarily caused Scranton's decline. This Tory faction, through the procedural delay of a much-needed post-war tariff bill, aimed to continue importing cheap coal from Nova Scotia in particular, and to sabotage the industrial aspect of Reconstruction in general, that being the best way to retain their monopolies upon manufacturing and the increasingly contracted currency. Manufacturers in the South would have competed with New England in the development of textiles, and manufacturers in the West would have broken the dependency the West had on New England consumer goods, for which the West traded away most of the gold and precious metals they mined. This then continually solidified New England's monopoly upon the contracted currency. So New England wanted to make sure that there would be no reconstruction in the South or construction in the West, or the industrial aspect of it would be mitigated as much as possible. Carey often referred to this policy of prioritizing cheap raw materials and cheap labor over industrial development as the British system of political economy. The New England faction, perhaps tragically obsessed with making good on the name of their region, had taken advantage of Lincoln's assassination in order to enforce this British style of economy upon the recovering nation. 
the national instability and frequent stoppages of production therefrom led to the mining region of Pennsylvania, which had supplied the northern manufacturers and Union naval blockade with cheap fuel to win the war, to now be set as sacrifice after the war to the ideological relatives of the defeated British-backed Confederacy. Although the base of the nation's industry, producing its energy and basic materials, in the years following the Civil War, the coal regions of Pennsylvania were perhaps as much a candidate for economic reconstruction or just construction as the South and the West. This is what British policy does for its most productive colonies. On top of this, add the disaster of species resumption and the morganization and monopolizations of the steel, rail, and energy industries, and you have the effective destruction of the American system of political economy. Track that to the present day, minus the two partial revivals of the American system under FDR and Kennedy, and you have the dream of global Britain, where the United States is but a dumb lummox enforcing British colonial policy by military might, and the only industry to be found is like that of Scap and Scranton. Instead of having increased its manufacturers and output in a win-win collaboration in the economic reconstruction of the South and the construction of the West, Scranton now in its destitution uses its last industrial capacities to load the gun aimed at itself and the rest of what's left of civilization threatening nuclear suicide. What else could be done? What survives a nuclear holocaust? Arguably not much. The biosphere of a planet engulfed in nuclear fallout could not be expected to support much of, if any, of its previous organisms. But regardless of the extent of potential catastrophe to happen, we must recognize that certain irreversible processes have brought us to the stage of development we currently experience. In some perceptible, and many currently imperceptible ways, the universe itself has been fundamentally altered by the irreversible process of reasoned development that no amount of megatonnage or radioactivity can ever fully erase. Let's lower the scale to the more manageable example of the catastrophe of post-industry that Scranton now experiences. An extensive, an extensive canal and rail system, the height of transportation in its day, flourished throughout the northeastern Pennsylvania and upstate New York regions. Domestic commerce multiplied upon itself like nowhere else. Coal ships to Kingston and Corning and Syracuse and Hamilton fueled steel mills and textile mills. Glass formed in the fires of anthracite lit in Corning made Edison's bulbs which illuminated the nation. Commerce and culture grew as intertwining vines upon this inland trellis. Now little is shared between these areas commercially or culturally. The transportation lines are either mostly historical relics or service some paltry amount of freight at low speeds and under negligent decrepit conditions. But the characteristic of the development of those rails and canals and the commerce they supported is of an irreversible quality that persists even after a century and a half of economic warfare and can still be acted upon. Applying the right confluence of already emerging breakthroughs in energy, materials, and transportation, the revival of this region from the revival of this region from the Hudson to the Lackawanna to Niagara into a highly productive economic corridor becomes a matter of natural order. Fusion research centers scatter this region, from those at Cornell and Lehigh University, as well as that of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, former Governor Mario Cuomo commissioned a design for a high-speed rail system throughout much of what had been these canal and rail lines, that high-speed rail design having been uh, patented and invented at the Brookhaven lab in New York. Most interestingly, recent efforts at a materials lab in M at MIT have shown the potential use of coal in both microelectronics, where it takes the place of silicon, and in a more cost-effective production of carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is gen in general is five times as strong and five times as light as steel and doesn't corrode. How to activate these potentials. Lyndon LaRouche's 2006 Economic Recovery Act called for the formation of a federal corporation to manage the machine tools of the collapsing auto industry and repurpose them toward large scale infrastructure projects. The same can be done today regarding the machine tools and potential productive output of the defense industries like those of the plant in Scranton. As a preliminary step, local municipalities can be required to assess their store of machine tools and manufacturing potentials in even abandoned industrial centers. For example, the looms of the former Scranton Lace Company, currently gathering dirt and rust, can trade out their punch cards for modern computers and be formatted to weave the most complex pieces of carbon fiber. One section of the overall misguided 2022 CHIPS Act calls for the construction of a carbon materials research center in the major coal-producing regions of the United States. The one placed nearer to this 
northeastern Pennsylvania, upstate New York region, should have a focus upon both the microelectronic and carbon fiber potentials of coal as a technology. As the Southwest Asia coordinator of the Schiller Institute, Hussein Haskari, has proposed for the petroleum production nations of that region, Southwest Asia, that as we transition to a fusion economy, petroleum will be better used as industrial material, the same should be done for these coal producing regions in the Northeastern United States, especially for the production of carbon fiber, which has the best chance of supporting the full scale mining industry. Finally, the last point of China's recently published position on the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis concerns promoting post-conflict reconstruction. Anthracite coal is the rarest and highest grade of coal. Subsequently, it has unique potentials for industrial use. The anthracite region of northeastern Pennsylvania, where Scranton resides, has the largest reserve of anthracite coal in the world. The second largest reserve is in the Donbass, which stands for Donetsk Coal Basin. China is the largest producer of anthracite in the world. The CHIPS Act is not best suited by being an embarrassing effort at isolated zero-sum catch-up with China's microchip manufacturing, but by being the basis for a technology sharing program which brings the PA Upstate New York corridor into the Belt and Road Initiative. Scranton is not best served by shipping munitions to eastern Ukraine, but by sending and receiving scientists and technology between itself, China, and the Donbass in order to design the carbon materials on which the future of the world and beyond will be built. Scranton's most rewarding role is not that of cowboy-hatted Major Kong at the apocalyptic end of the film Dr. Strangelove, joyriding its missile production into the sunset of oblivion, but that of an economic fulcrum for the end of the conflict in Ukraine and playing the crucial role it should have played in the reconstruction of the American South and West, instead now in the reconstruction of not just the Donbass in Ukraine and not just the Scranton upstate region itself, but in the reconstruction globally of a new financial security and development architecture. Thank you.